hello to everybody. And um, okay, I'm going to talk uh, now regarding the use of uh, vibration spectroscopy with neutrons. So this is a technique that is uh, not always uh, used; it's seldom used uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, most of them, there are only two instruments in the world that can do that. Um, so if we just go back and probably you have been shown these sort of pictures before, essentially when the neutron essentially interacts with matter, it does not, it does not always transfer energy, but also transfer momentum. If one just somehow measures the energy transfer and the momentum transfer on, on, on a sample, but in a sample in here, like this one, for example, one of the things that one observes is that this is what you will see, essentially a black picture with very bright dot spots at zero energy transfer. That essentially means that 99.9% .9 of your scattering is actually elastic scattering. This is diffraction and usually contains mostly structural information. If you now go and zoom in, this is of the order, it's not in the same scale as the previous one, this is of the order of a factor of 900, then you see that around that elastic line, the deformation of zero momentum transfer, the elastic scattering, you do have some intensity. And that intensity contains information, essentially about the motion of the atoms. You also might have seen that the information about the broadening of the, of the elastic line is what we use in quasi-elastic neutral scattering to look at the Doppler effect and see slow motions of uh, atoms in materials. So very basically what you have in an elastic neutron scattering is you have the interaction between the probe, that is the neutron, and the nucleus. There is a simultaneous transfer of energy and momentum that is done by the same neutron. For example, if you do X-ray scattering, or in general light scattering, you will use one wavelength, this, uh, for example, Roman, Roman the, um, a laser, you will use that wavelength to probe the vibrational motions, but at the same time, if you want to do the structural information you used to use an x-ray. So these two are very different things and you need two essentially two photons to prove two things. In the case of the neutron, the neutron actually probes those things at the same time simultaneously. The transitions, and this is very important, are proportional to the amplitude of emotion and the cross-section of the nuclei. And this is very, very important when, it come, when one comes across the need of do computer modeling. There are no selection rules in the vibrations of uh, atoms. Um, and in this presentation, just so we make that clear, I'm going to be talking all the time about incoherent in elastic neutron scattering and powder samples, okay? Because of the high um, cross-section of hydrogen, if you do have a sample that contains hydrogen, that will probably contribute most of your incoherent neutron. Okay? Um, in the case of incoherent neutron scattering, this formula that gives you the spectral intensity simplifies itself to this. And essentially, if you would want to try to take a cartoon representation of it, what you have essentially is a term that goes up, that this is Q squared U squared, where the Q is the momentum transfer, and U is the amplitude of that motion that comes multiplied by the cross-section of the atom, atom L, and divided, the, you have different orders, I'm going to explain what they are later. And this term essentially that goes up and it gets control on the other hand, is get dampened as, a, as your momentum transfer increases by this term in here that is essentially the wall effect, okay? So you have a parabola going up, an exponential decay, the product of those two objects gives you something along this shape. So you have a maximum at a certain momentum transfer. If you think in terms of what you get with the um, optical spectroscopies, and I show you later, optical spectroscopies all most of the time give you information at the gamma point, so a zero momentum transfer. So now, if we do have a harmonic oscillator uh, in a system, what does the neutron do? Well, the idea of uh, ex uh, um, exciting a vibration is that your particle, your probe, will come hit the sample move it from the ground state into the first excited state, and when it, essentially you will have more um, particles that we show in an intensity at that frequency. 
So if you have a harmonic oscillator, as I said before, with the neutron, and this is mainly because the neutron has a mass, the neutron will not only excite very efficiently the first, but it will also excite the second, the third, and so forth, all the higher tones. If you now look at the shape, if you look, this is the SQ omega map that essentially contains the information, momentum, and energy transfer. Along this axis, I have um, energy transfer. Along this axis, I have momentum. So is that if I look just at the fixed value of momentum transfer, this is what I see. This is the spectral intensity that I have. And this is what I call in elastic neutron scattering, what I'm interested in looking at. And if, if on the other hand, at a given energy transfer, I look sideways, I do see this uh, sort of shape that I showed you before is the Q squared U squared multiplied by the um, um, exponential decay from the divide wall factor. So the overtones and combinations are very much apparent. And if there is some, say, hydrogen in the system, there is a kinematic effect. And that kinematic effect is that all these overtones, okay, as you can see here, this is the first order, this transition. This is transition from the ground state to the second order. This is from the sec first to the third or second order, I say, the, so the third uh, excited state uh, that's here. So all of these essentially fall within a parabola that has a curvature that is associated with the mass of the atom. In the case of hydrogen, that parabola is uh, happens to have the same, yes? Sorry? Yes. That's the DK there, yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. I forgot to put the minus. That is correct. Well spotted. Otherwise, it goes the other way around. Yes, you're right. Sorry, I mean, I, I rewrote this curve because the last version of PowerPoint changed the equation editor, and it was showing garbage, so I rewrote it. I will take note of that. Thank you. So um, um, as I said, these guys uh, fall within a parabola with the curvature associated with the mass of the atom. So. If this parabola in this case is for hydrogen, but if you have something more heavy, for example, carbon, the parabola will do this, okay? Um, how do we measure the inelastic neutron scattering? Well, in order to measure it, we need to measure um, the incident energy and the final energy of the neutron before and after the collision with the sample, the scattering process. Most of the sc um, scattering that we're doing here, and I apologize to people from Haifa because I'm only describing here time of flight spectroscopy, okay? We take advantage of the neutron being produced in a very sharp pulse, and as it flies along the tubes, they spread out with different energies. There are two ways that you can do that. The first one is you essentially fix your incident energy you monochromate the incident beam, that that's usually done with a chopper that is a rotating disc or a rotating cylinder that essentially cuts um, the energies, the, the neutrons, except for some that are going through that window. And by doing this, we essentially fix the incident energy. So you see that the neutrons, are as a function of time, they're moving towards a fixed slope. And this is a representation of the chopper dust. Essentially, it only opens, but the neutrons are going to have a center time so by uh, changing the um, phase between the chopper and the source, I can essentially adjust the slope of this curve that is the energy of my neutron, the velocity. So you get these neutrons, you select the incident energy, you fix that incident energy, and then the neutron goes to the scattering event. It can go elastically, so essentially it gets scattered and continues with the same velocity, or it can gain energy from the neutron and it goes slower, or uh, sorry, um, yes, and uh, it gets faster, or it can lose energy with the sample and it goes slower. And these slopes in here and the colors are a re simple representation of the velocity. These are slower neutrons, these are faster neutrons. Because you know the incident energy and you know your distance between the sample and your um, moderator, where the neutrons are essentially being generated for any, any practical purposes, 
So the neutrons come here, they get scattered. I know what is the time that it will take a neutron to come from here to here. I know the distance, I know the time, I know the energy. Then I go and I say, okay, this is fixed. I know T1, my instrument is designed to fix that number. And then I go and measure the total time and I subtract the total time, the time of flight, I subtract T1 and I obtain T2. That essentially gives me the secondary time of flight. Now, if, at, if I look at the, this uh, very uh, schematic representation here, what you have is a neutron arrival in the sample and getting scattered. So you do have essentially an angle and as a function of that angle from the incident beam, this is going to be the so-called trajectory that the neutron is going to follow um, in energy and momentum space. If one looks at the, uh, and, uh, this is a particular spectra that was given to me by uh, the people from C uh, CNCS. Uh, this is how the spectra will look like as a function of energy and uh, intensity. If you now convert this back and you see how this original spectrum looks like as a function of uh, time of flight, you do see that essentially it looks like a replica of the other one. So the resolution, as a consequence of this design of this instrument, the resolution is con constant in units of the incident energy. The incident energy is the energy that I fixed with my monochromating device. In this case, it's a, it's a chopper. So the spectrum essentially looks the same way as you look at, sort of same way as you look at the energy or you look in time of flight. This is not the only way that you can measure uh, the energy transfer. You can also measure the energy transfer using what we call indirect geometry instrumentation. And the, the op modus operandi of this, of this instrument is like this. You do have your sample at a certain position, okay? And you allow all neutrons to hit the sample, okay? Neutrons of different, uh, different velocities, different energies. Now what you do is instead of monochromating the incident beam, you monochromate the outcoming beam after the spectra, after the scattering event. So we do that by using um, graphite analyzer in vision. Uh, that is essentially you select neutrons by a Bragg reflection, and then you put a beryllium filter that essentially cuts all the um, lambda by two, lambda by three, lambda by n uh, neutrons. So you get a very f a fixed energy. And when you have this configuration, essentially, your sampling of reciprocal space of, of, the, of the SQ omega map is like this. It follows these two trajectories that have this parabolic shape, okay? If you now look at how the spectra looks like, this is in energy, so it's the same direction that I was showing the previous one. If you now look and convert back how, th how the data really looks like in time of flight, it's actually inverted. This is my elastic line that comes here. This is my spectra. So it goes in the opposite direction. One consequence of the resolution of the um, uh, geometrical implementation of this technique is that your resolution is almost constant, but this time in own units of delta omega over omega. And in this particular case, it's 1.5 uh, percent. This is how the instrument looks from the outside. And if we know the little digression about how this thing essentially operates is, if you have direct, um, a direct geometry instrument, what you have is your incident neutron comes here. This is the sample. This is the initial momentum that the neutron is carrying. And then, of course, as, the, as it gets scattered for any fixed angle, essentially we'll have different momentum transfer, this mo different momentum the of the final neutron, and this is the momentum transfer of each one of them. So you do sample the reciprocal space in this way. For example, for this particular angle, it's something along the line of this blue line in here. When you look at an uh, indirect geometry instrument, on the other hand, what you change is the incident um, momentum of the, of the beam, and the final momentum gets fixed. Now, this final momentum, by design, is usually very, very, very small. So most of the time, one can consider that this Q this value of Q is very close to the, um, the momentum trust is very close to the incident momentum. Not exact, but very close. And this is how these uh, trajectories look when you overlap them. How do these things affect how we do, or what sort of science we do in our experiment is shown in here. I have represented here the plot with the correct sign. Um, 
for the intensity as a function of Q. And if you have a transition, uh, a, a transition in, your so in your solid that happens around 100 milli electron volt or 800 wave numbers, then you will see that the in, uh, in, uh, indirect geometry gives you good intensity. Uh, if you go now at 250 milli electron volts, you see that the intensity of the vibration, assuming that this uh, is, is described with the same physics, that actually the maximum is usually at the same time, uh, you see that we still have intensity, the height. But if you now look at the other 400 or 500 milli electron volts, what you find is that the intensity gets very much depleted, okay? So you don't see as much intensity as you'd expect. Uh, one of the characteristics of these instruments is that the um, direct geometry instrumentation usually, as you try to get a higher energy, you can essentially observe the information at lower Q, and that essentially gives you higher intensities than you see in here. The problem is that as you go in higher incident energy, your resolutions get, de get degraded, and also your uh, flux gets um, affected. So, yes, you can come with two electron volts, 2,000 milli electron volts, but the problem is that you will have probably very few neutrons that you can use to measure. So it's a trade-off, but in general, if you're looking at, for example, a stretching modes of molecules, uh, in particular, you probably will go for ge uh, direct geometry, but anything that is below 250 milli electron volts and it's a powder, and it's con containing hydrogen, you should go for an indirect geometry because our counting rates in here are two or three of or orders of magnitude higher. We have a lot of neutrons that we can count. So um, we both use momentum uh, transfer and energy transfer, and we characterize vibrational magnetic and lattice, lattice excitations. What I'm going to be mentioning mostly is the work related to chemistry, so I'm going to ignore magnetic effects. This is a view of the vision instrument here at the SNS. I assume that some of you have, uh, have done some, uh, some training on it. Um, vision is a phenomenal instrument. Um, it's 4,000 times uh, better than the previous instrument. The previous instrument was call, is called TOSCA. Is uh, at the ISIS uh, neutron spallation source in the United Kingdom, and I was the senior instrument scientist until I came here three years ago to take over the group here. And uh, it's a beautifully designed instrument. Um, these uh, mirrors that essentially contain the graphite analyzers contain of the other few hundred uh, one square centimeter single crystal pyrolytic graphite O2 that. Um, will set you back a few hundred uh, thousand dollars each, and we have 14 of those guys. Uh, and it, this is not in gold, okay? This is just an effect of cadmium when you take a picture with a flash. Um, anyway, so that how does the SQ Omega map looks like when you essentially um, uh, look it with an indirect geometry, like vision, or a direct geometry instrument, like Sequoia? Well. This, uh, this is a hypothetical solid that is not so hypothetical, it's graphite. Um, sorry, not graphite, uh, polyethylene. Um, where essentially I look in here, these black curves essentially show every single one is a single, along the trajectory is a single pixel on Sequoia. And as you go along, these are the sort of specs that you're going to have. As you go into higher momentum transfer, you will get a low, low momentum transfer, you will have a sharp peak at higher energies. If you look at the same data in vision, you will see that the intensity is a lot lower. But as you go into low, um, lower uh, momentum uh, neutron energy loss, what you see is that the resolution of vision increases as you go into l lower energies. The resolution of um, uh, sequoia remains constant. But of course, uh, you got very small numbers in here and your resolution is constant, your resolution gets degraded. So there's a trade-off. And if you were to have different numbers of incident energies, you could do trying to reconstruct the information that you obtain with an instrument like vision. And you have to do one, two, three, four runs in order to try to reconstruct the, in the information back. This is not the only, uh, the only drawback with doing this approach. There's another interesting effect that happens with um, 
when you measure in vision is that the instrument is essentially constant. You cannot change the instrument. Whereas in between inverted commas, when you have direct geometry instrumentation, you change the instrument energy, you really have sort of a different instrument with different resolution. Because the re resolution in vision is always constant, that means that if you me measure something and then you go measure something else and one has twice as much as the other, you are always going to be sure that you have twice as much material uh, or twice as much scattering in vision that you don't have in the other ones, okay? And that is very important when you count, when you try to track the amount of hydrogen that you have in a material because the very design of vision allows you to count all the intensity that goes exactly on top of mass one because the mass of the neutron and the mass of the proton are almost equal. So everything that new vision counts, if it's hydrogen, it will measure it. Whereas in if you do it with a direct geometry instrument, you are not sure. So how does uh, now in last neutron scattering compare when you look with different uh, um, vibrational tools? Well, this is a simple example uh, taken from literature um, by which this is size is salt. I mean, I, I have to disclose I'm a physicist, not a chemist, so I don't know much about this. But one of my friends told me that um, this was very important in organic metallic chemistry. And this is essentially the structure of this material. And this is what you get if you do Raman, uh, sorry, infrared, Raman, and it lasts in the scattering spectra. The curves in black are the um, uh, experimental data. The traces in red are the um, calculated spectrum. And one of the important things that you should never forget is that in elastic neutron scattering always will give you quantitative information. Whereas infrared and Raman, not necessarily so. And this is because of the existence of the um, selection rules. For example, you could have a, a vibration that you cannot see with Raman because of symmetry. So it has no intensity. Now you put that molecule on top of a surface, you suddenly change the symmetry of the system. So despite the fact that you do have a peak appearing out of the blue, that doesn't mean that you cannot quantitatively assign how much you have. If something is, is very advantageous from the point of view of uh, inelastic neutral scattering, is if I get twice, I have twice. So it's, it's proportional. Another very important thing that you have when you do neutron scattering and in particular in the last in Newton scattering, is that the correlation between theory, modeling, and experiment is pretty straightforward, okay? Um, and this is usually the sort of um, game that you play when you try to interpret experimental data, use your theory and your modeling in trying to build up a body of knowledge that will allow you to do, I don't know, produce better materials or better processes. When the neutron interacts with the, um, um, with matter in general, and if it's the case of a powder, as I said, it transfers momentum. If you have an energy, and if you look at an instrument like vision, and you have a energy transfer of the order of 50 weight numbers, and you project for a unit cell of a material that has, let's say, 15 angstroms or plus of um, unit cell, what you do is you can if you project the Brillouin zone, the essentially the larger the unit cell, the smaller the Brillouin zone, what you do is at 50 wave numbers onwards, what you are really doing is every single of these uh, lines in here is crossing the first Brillouin zone this way. So all these guys get projected into the first Brillouin zone where we get all the information regarding the motions of material uh, because of the Bloch theorem. So what we are really doing is we are doing a uniform sampling of the first Brillouin zone. This is very important because in general, optical spectroscopies only give you information at the gamma point. And although they could be extremely useful trying to identify different species and use for fingerprinting, in the case of neutron scattering, we do really have a real measurement of the vibrational density of states. Um, one of the things that if you look at um, original literature, and that includes a book that I wrote a few years ago, we always said that in instruments like vision or Tosca, it was going to be very difficult to do studies as a function of temperature because of that divide wall factor that essentially increases when the temperature increases, so essentially kills your signal. Well, I have to eat my words because we have demonstrated in vision that we can do experiments to very high temperatures. 
And just, I don't know how many of you have done the experiment or, or what instrument you're using, but in here, at one milli electron volt, I have 1,000 points. And here at 10 milli electron volts in that, in that space, when I contain it, as, um, I have one milli electron volts width, I can put 100 points. And you can see the sort of resolution that you have in there. So this is a phenomenally high, ca high counting instrument and that allows you to look now as a function of temperature, something that we never thought of was going to be possible. How do you calculate your elastic neutron scattering spectra? Well, um, if you, there's a very easy um, software that I wrote a few years ago, it's called a climax, that essentially allows you to use what is called the isolated molecular approach to study molecular solids. Let's say that you have benzene, okay? You do a calculation of all the vibrational modes of benzene using your favorite software, could be molecular mechanics, could be DFT, could be Gaussian. And you take, you have an isolated molecule that sometimes contains enough, enough information for you to understand a lot of things on the system. But the total intensity needs to be calculated in a very precise way. The equation that I wrote at the beginning that had the wrong sign, actually, um, that equation looks simple but it's highly complicated because it contains all the possible cross products between tensors. Now, if you use this program and you extrapolate and you say, I'm going to sample the first Greenland zone very densely with computer modeling, then what you do is you do have no longer, this, the, the spectra is rigorous. There is no approximation apart for the harmonic approximation. And these have some consequences that escape this, uh, this uh, uh, short lecture, but uh, they could be important when you do research. Uh, I'm going to show a simple example, uh, a calculation that's been done using the CASTEP software from Accelerys, uh, with all sorts of funny technical details. I will do a very uh, uh, fine sampling of the first Greenland zone. And this, for example, how magnesium hydra will look like. If you look at the total contribution to the intensities, you will have your vibrations. As I said before, the intensity of the, of the um, spectrum is proportional to the amplitude of motion. That essentially means that these guys move more than this guy, okay? So you do have the density of states, sample inside the first brilliant zone, but the spectrum actually consists of the sum of the or, uh, fundamentals, all the overtones and combinations, essentially all the possible combinations that you have in there, all the second orders, all the way up to 10 quantum events. And when you have all of them and you sum them together, what you have is the total simulated spectra. But then you go and in principle, can compare with um, uh, experimental spectra. This is a very old data. I should change this with vision data now. But anyway, this is uh, an example of how magnesium hydra compares when you show, uh, when you look at what you can calculate and what you can measure. Because the correlation between uh, computer modeling and in last Newton spectra is uh, so tight, um, what we do have in here, the SNS, is we have an integrated modeling environment for the imp interpretation of the data. And what we do in here is we have virtues. I mean, uh, that essentially is a computer that is, we call it for virtual experiment spectroscopy, and essentially allow us to do your experiments. In principle, in some cases, uh, we can do the modeling while the experiment is being happening. And this is a sort of correlation that you do have between the experiment, as I showed before, this sorry, the experiment in the, yel in the orange trace here, compared with the experimental data that you show uh, shown here and the, and the calculated data in here. And the methodology that we use in order to get the um, uh, interpretation of the data is you take any calculation that you like, either the ones that you can do, or the guys that some people in the team can help you do, and you calculate your vibrational modes and frequency. And with that information, the frequencies and the modes, uh, you get the simulation that is using this software that I mentioned before. That essentially gives you your simulated in last unit of scattering spectra. On the other hand, you do have your sample, hopefully, you put it into vision, you reduce the data, analyze it, and then you have a spectrum 
there is an uh, elastic, and also you get the diffraction. Vision is also a very good diffractometer. And with that information, you try to understand by assigning what are the motions that correspond to the peak that you observe in the spectra. With that information, you essentially trying to get the structural dynamical relations. Uh, that essentially allows you to understand what the mechanisms and the properties at atomic levels. And I'm going to start showing a series of studies of how we use this in practice in a minute. Uh, we study other effects, for example, the effects on harmonicity. We can um, map the local energy potential that um, the system uh, essentially explodes while it's moving. And this is very important, the effect of our harmonicity response or phase transitions and all those things. Um, and also we use uh, trying to understand kinetics and transition pathways. All of that that we do, we do measuring at 5 Kelvin. I forgot to mention that. Um, an example of how we have used this before is uh, um, this is an experiment that was done on a relatively large system and we started doing the simulation at the beginning of the experiment. So when the experiment was, uh, while the experiment was uh, being collected, the calculation was essentially finished and we can check uh, the the our theoretical predictions and the experimental predictions and that essentially allow us to decide what's going on and trying to understand one should never forget that uh, whatever we do with uh, computer modeling is always an approximation. It's always a model. It is not reality. So this is an example of uh, what uh, these guys did in this experiment. And this was a particular material that was a glassy material. And the first thing that they did is they measured the black line. They essentially squenched. You just put the material, dip it into liquid nitrogen, trying to quench it. And when they were measuring the quenched material, they realized that, well, the modeling is not per perfect, but all this, you see, you have a sharp peak in here, you have a sharp peak in the calculation. You can more or less identify what every single mode is doing, and you realize a lot of intensities you are losing from this mode, because you also can understand, because you can see that in the computer, what that mode is doing, you say, hey, we are having a problem here. This is not what we expect. So we took the sample out, the guys took it out, put it back again, make a slow cooling, and you can see how the crystallizing effect really changes the shape of this peak. And it really gets closer what you would, you would expect from the, the calculation. Another thing that is very interesting here that you can probably start seeing is that we are quantitative. So the intensities of the peaks, okay? If I say that this peak is twice as this, so there's a relation of intensity, you see that the re re uh, relation of the intensities is preserved when you do the calculation. And this is because when you do when the interaction of the neutron with matter, what happens is the neutrons interact with the nucleus. So when you do a calculation, what you do is you do some quantum mechanics on your electrons, if you do density functional theory or, or some higher order uh, method, but the motion of the nuclei, okay, is, um, is, is, is being represented as a consequence of the electrons. If you do x-rays or do any sort of optical spectroscopy, what you have is that your probe, that is the photon, interacts actually with the electric cloud that is moving as a response of the motion of the nuclei. So you do have a double, you have to tap twice into the electronic effect. And this tapping twice into the electronic effects can essentially um, make your calculations first a lot more complicated, and secondly, they are not quantitative. Usually you cannot calculate very effectively the intensities of Ramar or infrared, whereas in neutrons, we really can rely on the relative intensity. You see this peak in here, it's not precise, it's not perfect, but there's one peak here, there are two peaks here, one with the shoulder. This guy in here is just two peaks, there's two peaks in there, and this peak in here with the shoulder. Despite the fact of not being exactly precise and, and exact, they still, the relative intensities, all of them have to be preserved. Um, so now I'm going to just uh, walk you guys through a series of examples of some of the science that we have done in here and trying to get you a, an idea of what can you do with INS, okay? So this is an example of uh, hydrogen in a relatively simple molecular solid, okay? Ammonia, NH3, has a very nice and simple structure. We did this calculation in here. Uh, the experiment in here is the blood curve. Very pretty. Usually the calculation is extremely good. We can really rely on them. And the first thing that we notice, the calculation doesn't work. I mean, this one can work better. But this guy in here, 
is completely out of order. You see that this, all of these peaks are really shifted to blue shifted to high energy. And we were considering what was going on in here. And um, well, ammonia has a lot of funny things in between that it has a lone pair, it has a, uh, some funny electronic structure where the, the lone pair is pointing. And as this guy starts moving, uh, we can identify that this peak is this guy in here. And what you are really observing in there is that the, ammonica, the ammonia molecule, when it rotates, doing this motion, essentially, it needs to have a threefold potential. And the fact that the threefold potential does not describe, is not described correctly within the low energy amplitude motions that you usually do for doing the calculation. So essentially, it does not work. Um, it does have a very interesting effect, but this, what is very interesting is this ammonia is highly harmonic at any possible temperature. Now, you go and put ammonia in any other material almost, and suddenly these guys, you see this is where the sharp line, uh, these are the unharmonic modes, these two, they come in here, and what's starting to happen, this, uh, the moment that ammonia interacts with anything, anything else but ammonia, um, it seems to have in a more harmonic behavior. So the rotational uh, barrier, the, the activation energy barrier that you do have and is responsible for the harmonicity of the so-called vibrational modes of ammonia um, gets so high that your representation of the curvature as your uh, vibrational frequency is getting more and more correct. And this is, this is curious because I did this uh, experiment when I look at a very interesting material that's called lithium ammoniate. And I don't have the slide in here, unfortunately, but this is a very beautiful material. It's called an expanded metal. If you go below 80 Kelvin, that's where the eutectic point, it suddenly turns into a metal, and it goes from blue into to deep gold color, and essentially it expands itself by a factor of two. It's actually the lightest metal that uh, we know. And this material was highly harmonic. And I was curious, uh, why on earth is this thing harmonic? So I said to the other guys, look, le let's go and measure ammonia. So just to make sure that we are not measuring ammonia. And funnily enough, ammonia is an unharmonic one, whereas all the other ones happen to be harmonic. Um, anyway, this is sort of, as well, you can see the comparison of the calculations. The, bl the black line in here, the red and the green is two different loads of ammonia in the metal organic framework. And um, the essentially what you take is, this is the different signal. So what you do is you put your MOF into the sample, into the beam, you put it empty, then you put some ammonia onto it, and then you subtract one signal from the other. Neutrons are extremely good at doing that. The in elastic to scattering, you just have something, you put something else, the subtraction, that's your signal, full stop. So this is the, the blue line, the um, black, the green line corresponds to the sample empty or le a smaller, a smaller sample, a smaller loading. And this is a similar, uh, this is a simulated spectrum of ammonia of the difference, okay? And this is what we have in here. As you can see, it is very good at locating where the, where the things are because you know what these guys are doing. You can go and then interpret how it works. However, it doesn't matter how precise your calculation is it will never be able to match experiments as much as it can because it's just too many things that are being ignored as we're doing these things. Another characteristic of uh, this unique division is, as I said before, is the high canting rate. Uh, this is the spectrum of carbon dioxide that has a very, very small cross-section for any, any practical purposes. And um, we tried once to measure that in, in the UK, in Tosca, and you can barely see this peak and not much else. This is how the spectrum looks like. And if you zoom in into it, you do see this is the, the blue line corresponds to the calculation. So just to compare the quality. And this is the most important thing, although it's uh, something that's been known for ages. We're not trying to get new science, but the fact that we can measure the Fermi resonance on CO2, a thing that had never been done before neutron scattering. We can do it with vision. We can see it beautifully measured and then uh, determined. So this essentially the um, Fermi resonance is when one overtone, so two omega, or omega one plus omega two, falls on top 
of a fundamental transition, in this case, the CO, um, the CO symmetric stretching. And when they do that, essentially, they interact with each other and they give you this, all these effects. Instead of getting this, we get those two peaks in here. And this is the first observation of the Fermi resonance using uh, INS. Because the other thing is that because it's high counting rates, we have done, this is another example of uh, work that we've done with vision recently. And we are able to measure essentially the spectrum of a sample. This is a nanoporous carbon sample, CAO. And what you do is you measure the spectrum as shown in black, and then you add up uh, carbon dioxide to it. And these materials are used for, or try they have been trying to be designed for doing carbon capture. And what you do is your CO2 goes onto the sample, and you can see this sharp line in here, and in principle, that's not that much. However, if you leave the sample to react for a few days and you put it back into the beam, what you obtain is this red curve that you have in here. And what that red curve it is in here is, well, you still have a little rem remnant of the CO2, the CO motion, it's actually this motion, the flapping of the oxygen around the C, the carbon. This essentially decreases a bit, but you do see this increase of intensity in here. If you now compare the spectrum of water, you do see that these guys in here, this the red trace in here, actually does not quite match ice because ice is a crystalline structure, but it falls in the area where we do expect to see water. Not only that, we do see this uh, spectral intensity in here. This sharp peak is a spurious peak. But you do see this intensity in here. You see that in the red trace. And you get those peaks in here. So we can quite confidently assign this as the existence of formation of water. And this is very important because what we have in here is that the uh, species that have been left in there are able to chemically react with CO2. And CO2 is really on the bottom of the thermo thermodynamic well. So CO2 does not want to react in principle. But in this particular case, the catalyst is able to react with hydrogen with CO2 and form water on the surface of the material. This is quite extraordinary, and the fact that you can measure this at all is absolutely, uh, I mean, that, that will be have been called, I would have called this science fiction five years ago. Another area where we are, um, have a lot of um, footprint is uh, essentially on the area of hydrogen in metals. And we essentially study, uh, as a function of temperature, we can study how the density of state changes uh, and then compare with simulation. And we can try to understand what is the dynamics that uh, drives the formation and dissociation of metal hydrides. This has uh, some interest in the area of hydrogen storage at the time, but there's a lot of other system, there are a lot of other applications that are having on these systems at the moment. So um, we have uh, also, you can also look at the formation of materials in the beam. This is uh, outside the normal realm. If you go to trying to do this at, at ISIS, in my previous job, uh, they will tell you that you cannot do it. But in here, we measure at 575 Kelvin, 200 centigrade, and we can see the process of formation of magnesium hydra as a function of time and uh, hydrogen pressure. Um, Catalysis is another area where we are very much involved. Um, the study of uh, hydrogen on palladium is, is, is pretty relevant. And this is a catalyst that contains a very, very, very tiny amount of hydrogen, uh, palladium on the surface. It's palladium supported in alumina, I think. And what you have is that this is what you see, the huge peak if you put hydrogen. They're going to show later what it is. And this is what you would expect coming from the formation of palladium hydride on the, sur on, on the solid, the, the bulk palladium hydride. What we can measure in here is what is the contribution of the surface, subsurface layer of hydrogen formed on the palladium. This is actually the hydrogen, uh, these are the hydrogen atoms that are actually involved in chemical reactions. So this is what we can identify in here. I think this is the first time that this has been uh, identified in an uh, active catalyst using neutrons. Uh, one uh, particular um, example of the application of neutrons that is uh, very relevant and is not uh, usually 
uh, possible to do with other techniques is the study of the rotation of line of hydrogen. This is the theory in a nutshell. Hydrogen exists in two different species of molecules. You get parahydrogen with the antiparallel spins, and then you get orthohydrogen, there's a three combination of, of um, uh, symmetric and, uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of nuclear spins. So the transition between parahydrogen and orthohydrogen are not allowed in principle in optical spectroscopies, but they are allowed with neutrons, and it has very different cross sections. Uh, in solid parahydrogen, in solid hydrogen, the molecules rotate with an energy of uh, the order of, uh, uh, you get the sharp line at 118 wave numbers of 14.7 million electron volts. If you have an interaction, essentially what happens is that if, you see that that's why you don't have the sign on the other one because uh, when you transfer from the other one to the other half is gone. Anyway, <laughs> so um, um, if you have a potential energy surface and the molecule is interacting, the, it does it does essentially feels the potential of the surface. And I say no many techniques, no other techniques can see that. And what happens is the rotational um, levels of hydrogen get shifted and, and, and split. And this is an example of what happens. If you do have that the molecule of hydrogen is trying to be aligned, for example, say perpendicular to the surface, okay, uh, essentially if the force is trying to align, what you have is your uh, density, your uh, rotational line gets split into two. One that goes down, this corresponds to the M equals zero um, branch, whereas the M equals plus minus one goes up. So what you do is yeah, that your rotational lines split up and maybe shift. If you go on the other side, and what you do is your molecule is trying to lay flat onto a surface, what you do have is that you get the effect, but you get the double degenerate goes down and the other one goes up. So, so far, what that's what the theor theory says. So what you expect is if you look at uh, pure hydrogen, this is your rotational line. You put that on the top of graphite, and this is what happens. So essentially, you have the solid, when you put it on top of graphite, it broadens a bit. There's not much interaction between graphite and hydrogen. And it shifts a little bit uh, down. That is probably due to a zero point energy change. When now you have a single wall nanotube, what you have essentially is your graphite surface is curved. Okay? So when your graphite surface is curved, this is what happens. You get that instead of having one peak, you have two peaks. This is a very small sample, that's where the spectra is rubbish. And as you try to build a model of how the hydrogen aligns on the, on the surface of the nano, nanotube bundles, this is what happens. This is what happens in the solid, the sharp line. And you can see you have the two lines, the two peaks in here. And those peaks go all the way until you go a very high loadings, okay? And this essential, this split of the rotational line is telling you that the breaking of the symmetry on the surface because of the curvature, it starts to interact a bit with the hydrogen. But the change still is not that big. Now, what happens when the hydrogen interacts with something that is relatively strong, like, for example, uh, hydrogen interacting with a copper center in a metal organic framework? This is um, H-cast. Well, this is what you have. Remember, your rotational line should be around here. It is not there. What you have is you get the line around nine, and this line grows as a function of loading. You start having half a hydrogen molecule per copper site, and then you go all the way up to having four of them, so you go up. And then you get a second site that appears, and you get the third site that appears, and you get the fourth site that appears, and you get the site, a, a peak that grows up with the first site and then goes. Now, as I said before, in last minute of scattering is highly quantitative. So if I just look at the integrated intensity of each individual peak, I know that as a function of my coverage, I saturate the first side, then stays flat. I get the second side that goes has this shape. I got the third side that has this shape, the fourth side that, that have this shape and so forth. So I can have some sort of a side by side, totally discrimi completely discriminated absorption isotherm of hydrogen on surfaces. Another example of this application is the example of quantum sieving. 
in quantum sieving, what you have is the idea is that you can separate hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium by the zero point energies. You absorb them in different materials, and because they have different energy, different the idea was that they have different size of the holes, and then your dynamical diameter, because hydrogen is very light, has a larger wave function, whereas um, deuterium is heavier, has a smaller wave, wave function. That was the mechanism for this process. So this material, for example, when you absorb hydrogen, what happens is that you get the side one that you put a little bit, and you see these two peaks growing. Then you put a little bit more, and you get those two peaks keep on growing. And then you saturate that peak, and then you get the second peak. So there's very clearly two different sides. One is more energetically um, absorbent than the other one. So, and they know that this material is very good because you flow at low temperatures, you flow uh, hydrogen and deuterium, and you can separate them. So we're trying to understand what the mechanism was, and if you, okay, there you go. So the experiment consists as follows. You put hydrogen into the system, so you do have two sides, okay, side one and side two, and when you have this sort of arrangement, you have these two, and these two um, um, energies of absorption. So if you put, now deuterium, so you try to fill only the first side and put deuterium on the top. So what you have is this black curve in here, and on top of that, what you do is you put a little bit, the black curve is you put a little bit of deuterium on top of hydrogen that you absorb first, then you close the valve, warm up the system at uh, 170, uh, 220 Kelvin, you cool down, and the spectrum that you form now is the spectrum shown in the red curve. There's a zoom in in there, and what you see is very clear. You have that all the hydrogen that was in the side one, because I forgot also to mention this, deuterium has almost no cross-section compared with hydrogen. So if I have deuterium in instead of hydrogen, I will see no signal. The rotational line has a different value because it depends on the mass, but it will have almost no cross-section. So what you see is that what your hydrogen was in the, right in the, in the black trace, when you heat it up and cool down, you get the red trace. The amount of hydrogen is the same because I have is this is a closed system. But you do see that all the, in the hydrogen that was in here goes up to here. And you subtract, I think you can, yeah. If you subtract the black from the red from the black, this is what you have. So all the hydrogen that was in the side number one goes into the side number two. So that essentially proves what was my original idea, and I'm not sure that my collaborators were, that the real driving force of this is the difference in the zero point energy of the absorption of deuterium and hydrogen, just because hydrogen is lighter than deuterium. Um, if you look at molecular hydrogen in the solid, what you have is that you have a very sharp line. As you go across the um, uh, melting point, so from hydrogen goes from a solid into a liquid, what you have is that this rotational line disappears. So the rotational line of hydrogen is an indication of how hydrogen, what is the state of hydrogen at in, in matter, okay? The molecular hydrogen in matter. And this is a very interesting experiment that we did looking at molecular hydrogen, this is porous carbon. Hydrogen is supercritical, about 20 something uh, Kelvin, no, 30 something Kelvin. That means that it, it doesn't matter in principle how much pressure you put, you will not turn into a solid. However, with this experiment at 77 Kelvin, and what we found is that we do see the rotational line of hydrogen. The rotational line of hydrogen can only be present if we do have hydrogen that essentially is not recoiling. So essentially it's like if it is in a solid matrix, or at least it, it doesn't have any translational degrees of freedom. On the other hand, everything that goes at the elastic line that I'm showing here indicates what the hydrogen is doing here what the hydrogen is doing. If the hydrogen has a signal on the quasi-elastic region, the elastic region, that can be because it's either a solid or a liquid. Now, if you put these things together, we can, by integrating those areas, because of the quantitatively nature of inelastic neutron scattering, what you can go is, you can integrate, and you know all the gas that's going into the system, so you can determine it, but above all, you can say what fraction of that hydrogen, when it's under pressure and confined, it behaves like a solid, 
and what part of this hydrogen behaves like a liquid. And this is very important because there's no other technique that will give you that information on a system. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, other studies and I'm just showing you the thing is going to be the last one because I have no more time. Uh, this nitrogen and metal organic framework, um, again, it's the same story. We have a porous material, we have motions, we characterize them. Now, you put nitrogen in there. Nitrogen has no cross-section, but the interaction of nitrogen with the framework in this particular metal organic framework is very strong. This peak in here goes all the way up to here, and it modifies the shape of the rest of the spectrum. By calculating what is the ex example that you obtain when you have the near, uh, nitrogen is in or is, or is out, what you can, you can try to see is by using computer modeling, you can see this peak coming in here and all these peaks moving in different directions. You can essentially identify what is the nature of the system and what is the nature of the interaction that makes this uh, pores open up. And in this case, what the phenomenon is that this when the nitrogen goes in there, the um, window of the metal organic frameworks opens up. And as a consequence of the process of opening up, I think they have the, the next slide here. No, anyway. As a consequence of the process of opening up, essentially, it essentially stiffens the librational model of the CH groups that is the signature that we see in here. So they have a couple of examples that I'm not going to go through now because it's a bit too late. But let me just, yeah. It's going to be the last two, I apologize for that. The instrument is extremely sensitive. And although it doesn't look much if you guys are familiar with us using our experimental techniques, we can measure very, s what this is very small in lasting neutron scattering, okay? And we have measured, as I said before, this is the example of the CO2, this example of, um, of sugar, but we have also measured carbon nanothreads. And these carbon nanothreads are formed by compressing at very high pressures a benzene. Okay? And this is a very interesting state of matter. Um, and what we're doing here is an example. They've, um, the group that did the, this original paper in Nature, they're considering this was going to be the sort of structure that you can have. And by doing the elastic neutral scattering and the computer modeling, we actually proved that this structure in here cannot be responsible the spectrum that we observe, whereas this sort of structure, sort of instead of a nano thread, it's a nano worm, uh, is what it should be responsible the spectrum that we have. So we can use also um, the fact of the trying to fit the not only the structural data, because those two data sets are compatible from the point of view of structure, the distance between the atoms, but is this the, di the structure that gives you the right dynamics, what determines what is responsible for the motion. This is a very small sample, this is, is a work in progress. As a consequence of that work, we have decided, we have uh, got some money to build. This is the largest diamond anvil cell ever built um, anywhere. And this thing contains two single crystal diamonds that are the size of the top of my finger, about an inch long. And we are working at the moment and trying to put materials and obtain a um, high pressures, and look at the motions of things that you cannot usually look with other techniques. Okay? So in conclusion, guys, uh, I'd like you to go home with the idea that INS is very powerful to study materials and dynamics. Hydrogen scatters very well. If you have hydrogen, that's what you're going to be seeing. That's good because hydrogen is not always easy to see. Uh, there are no selection rules. We provide densities of states, average of the first brilliant zone, weighted by the cross sections. Um, neutrons, well, you know that from any other thing that you've done in here. Slice through metals, you don't need windows. Stainless steel sometimes works. Um, hydrogen in a molecular form behaves very differently from atomic hydrogen. And the use of the rotational line of hydrogen to identify the state of hydrogen in the system is unique to neutron scattering. We can use some hydrogen bonded systems. And finally, from an experimental point of view, direct and indirect geometry complement each other, uh, but they look, at, and they look at different energy range. A direct geometry is better looking at high frequencies and lower Qs, but indirect have better resolution and most importantly, fluxes at low frequencies. Okay, so any questions?
why am I highlighting the first brilliant zone? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, that's correct. Essentially, what you're saying is that from, from any practical point of view for powders, okay, from any practical point of view from powders, what you're interested, okay, is in getting the phonon density of states. The phonon density of states is, the, um, is uh, all the phonons average the first brilliant zone. All the information is there. And what the technique does is essentially, well, that's why we project to demonstrate that what will we do. Yes, it is. It's correct. It's from all brilliant zones, but it's average. So, but every th everything that happens on uh, any other brilliant zone apart from the from the first can be projected back. For any practical purposes, what you want is a full integration. All the thermodynamic functions, you will get them through the full integration of the of the over the first brilliant zone. So that's why we do that. It's, it's similar to the previous question. W um, essentially, when you uh, when you have the brilliant zone, um, when you look at your phonons, your phonons essentially have a dependence on the Q vector. So they really sample the whole the brilliant zone. Let me remind you that we're talking about powders in here, okay? So this is not this is not a line, okay? Now, if there are powders, okay, uh, what you see the dispersion or your dispersion relations, you are with with indirect geometry, you are really sampling, on average, the first brilliant zone by means of looking at the other brilliant zones. That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, but essentially, it, it, it projects all into the first brilliant zone. And that, that's rigorous. Okay. <laughs>